my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'll be your uh, behind the scenes host for the most part uh, tonight on EdChat Interactive. And tonight we'll be, our, we'll be led by Carl Hooker, who will be talking about integrating a mobile learning mindset in the classroom. There's a, there's a difference between a mobile learning mindset and mobile learning. This is not a how to about um, press, you know, press this key or click here or you have to use this application. This is much more about how do you, how does the whole classroom interaction change when we introduce mobile learning in, in, in the classroom? Well, welcome to EdChat Interactive, Carl. Hey, thanks for having me, Mitch. This has been fun already. We've been already playing around with some of the other features like I am and doing direct messages. I was already talking to Stevie earlier. Uh -huh. That was great. So you headline today, right? You, yeah, you, oh, yeah. at Future, Future Ready Summit. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with Future Ready Schools. It's a US initiative, and I know that um, I believe Ken's from Australia, so he may not be uh, familiar with it. But uh, what it is is uh, I think this is the 16th summit they've done. They do them all over the country, and it's a partner with uh, Alliance for Ed and the US Department of Education. And so today, my district actually attended um, to be a part of this to like to make ourselves future ready. Um, we kind of feel like we already are, but we want to look at where we're missing. And so one of the requests uh, last week from Tom Murray, who runs the event, asked me to keynote it this morning, too. So at the last minute, I, I did a keynote, um, tried some new material, and it was fun. It was a lot about failure and the fear of failure and um, why some superintendents and leaders are, are afraid to fail. So um, it was a good talk. So it's okay for students to fail, but it's not okay for administrators <laughs> to fail, right? That's right. I think I, one of the quotes on some of my, one of my posters at ISTE was, uh, you know, students can't fail if teachers don't take risks or students don't take risks if teachers don't take risks and then it's teachers don't take risks if administrators don't take risks and that's as you can see the trickle down effect for sure so just and maybe um you could just let people know what's the title of your book you know your newest book. Uh, uh my book is mobile learning mindset it's a six-part series um the first two are already out and they are basically the original idea was I was going to write an, an entire book on just everything about mobile learning. And as I started getting into it, it got really big and thought, you know, for this parts of this book aren't for everybody. So I broke it up into six books. And the first two that are already out are directed toward district administration and campus administration. Um, the next two that have uh, been written and are in editing right now, one is for uh, coaches or instructional um, professional learning. And then the fourth book is for teachers and classroom environment. Uh, the one I'm just now finishing writing is uh, for parents and the community. And then um, the last book will be instructional technology, or not instructional, but um, IT, tech staff, tech departments. So each part will have, each book is kind of the same in some ways in that they'll have 10 chapters and certain chapters align the same way. The idea is to have everyone with a common language. So um, I try to attack it from six different viewpoints. And then the idea is, as a district, if you're wanting to do a mobile learning uh, rollout or initiative of some sort, is that you would buy the set and then give a different book to each person. That way you can have a kind of a common conversation from each perspective. Wow, that's cool, that's interesting. So I know um, when you sent me your slides originally, there were something like 300 slides. <laughs> this is the wrong file. So I, I panicked, but you still have quite a few flight slides. So, so I guess it's best if I bring myself down and bring your slides okay. up, right? OK, sure. here we go. And I'll just tell you to, to collect next when it's time. And there they come. This is actually a very fun platform. I uh, Mitch got to show it to me last week. And for those of you that have never been a part of it, I know a couple of you mentioned in the IM there that you haven't been a part of an ed chat before interactive. This is neat. So um, you're seeing a very kind of a truncated conversation because I don't want to do a, just a stand and deliver, obviously, for an hour on a webinar platform. So you'll see a few slides, and then I'll ask a prompting question, as Mitch mentioned. And then we'll, we'll try to get into groups as best we can. I know not all of you have. Um, your web cameras enabled, so maybe the people with cameras can kind of cluster into groups, and the people with that with a little egghead can just get together and do like a IM chat. Um, so yeah, this is the book, uh, Mobile Learning Mindset uh, District. Uh, that's the district book for district administration. You can see uh, each book will actually have its own different color that comes along with it. And if you go to the next slide, um, Mitch, I'll tell you a little bit about myself too. Um, so. Uh, I am based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, one of the requirements to be a district in Texas is you have to have a giant logo with the state of Texas in it. Uh, so we check that box. Uh, not really, but it seems like that's the case. Um, so Eans ISD, that's how that's pronounced, Eans. It sounds like beans. 
Um, we are a school district of about 8,000 kids um, located west of Austin, Texas, the capital. And um, we've been doing one-to-one uh, -one for the last uh, five years. We started in 2011. Um, we did a uh, pilot with our high school, about 1,800 uh, students did, uh, got iPads at the uh, junior and senior level and a few sophomores uh, and upper level classes. And then we slowly kind of rolled it out over the next two years to where now, if you go um, to the next slide, Mitch, we, you can see that we're actually now one-to-one, -one, all students, all staff. So about 8,000 students and change, a little less than 1,000 staff, which means we have about a 9,000 in our deployment. Uh, my daughter, who uh, just left to go Pokemon hunting out the window uh, just a minute ago, actually, she uh, she's a second grader next year. And my other daughter, my second daughter is a kindergartner, and they're both gonna have, they both have iPads in their classroom. Um, they don't take them home. Only 6th through 12th grade take them home. Um, but a lot of what the books are written about and what this talk is about is just kind of what we've discovered over the last five years, um, kind of the kind of the aha moments and the things that, uh, that we've seen shift um, just since introducing technology. And as Mitch mentioned at the onset, for those of you that didn't join earlier, um, this isn't going to be just a how to use an iPad session. It's more of a, the mindset around mobile devices in general. So Chromebooks, laptops, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, cell phones, you know, bring your own device. It's all about this kind of mindset. So we're going to hope to keep it um, fairly general. Um, before we go to that, I'll maybe go back in time a little bit. So on the next slide, you'll see that um, this is what uh, technology integration looked like in my classroom. I used to be a fifth and first grade teacher. And um, I don't know how many of you were teachers back in the early 2000s, but this was pretty much it when it came to tech integration. You know, you had this little computer center in the back. Uh, and for maybe 15 minutes a week, the kids would rotate through and they would play games like um, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? And Reader Rabbit and Oregon Trail, which is one of my favorite because you could die so many different ways. Um, and, and, and I could kind of check the box that I had integrated technology. You know, the kids were plugged in and they were just kind of consuming the content. Uh, I realized quickly as a teacher that uh, that was not really the best use of the device. I mean, these were $1,200 desktops and just to use them as kind of a rote game or a conceptive device wasn't really what all, uh, really the bang for our buck that we wanted out of them. So we started using creative platforms like Claris Works and Hyper Studio to have kids design things. And I thought that was pretty incredible to see just kind of what they would come up with, uh, kind of a blank slate. Um, and as I started doing more research into one-to-one, -one, I actually came across uh, an image that was, um, it was actually a painting by a French artist uh, named Jean-Marc Cotier. And it was 1899 was the year that he painted this picture. And in the next slide, you'll see that this is what technology integration will look like in schools. And um, as you might be able to see there, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's, uh, I'm a big fan of that class size. I love seven to one. That looks great. Um, apparently, if you were female in the year 2000, you're out of luck because it looks like it's an all boys academy here. Uh, the other thing is, if you're the one boy, that, the unfortunate lad there that has to turn the crank, he's not learning today because, uh, you know, he's got to be the one that's cramming the books inside the kids' heads. And so to go back to the code of the next slide again, you'll see back at that image before, it looks kind of familiar in some ways, right? You see, Kind of this idea that we're just going to kind of push content and consume it um, and and to be honest uh, when we first rolled out ipads it was almost the same thing so if i take that the next image you can see that i've kind of superimposed on the next image the same kind of concept um, these are actually these are students from our high school the first year we did it um, i walked i walked through the building and there was this weird thing where kids were taking selfies of their faces and putting them as their um, screensavers but i thought that's a clever idea in case they were it ever got lost um, but it also was kind of like a science fiction movie when I walked through the hallways and saw that. Um, and when I talked to the teachers, they were telling me like, oh, this is, you know, this is great, but, um, you know, does it have my textbook on it? And, and uh, can I just, you know, use it as an e-reader? And so I, th I thought about it and I thought, you know, that's a great first step. And I think that is important to use it for some of those things. But I thought if that's all we're using these things for, and, you know, they're $400 devices. If that's what we're using them for, then it's definitely not, um, not the best use of it. And we could just use, you know, some sort of other e-reader. So you know, to really think that that was where it stopped was kind of the thing that troubled me at first. So we started talking about what are, what are some other things we can do and, and asking teachers, what are some other things that we could do? Um, and, you, and you think of the word 21st century learners and you think, well, it has to be about, you know, technology, the four C's, you hear all these phrases. And, and as you can see on the next slide, this is actually an image from uh, a friend of mine, um, Rabbi Michael Cohen, about 21st century learners. And he calls it the invisible iPad for a reason. When I walk into the best classrooms in our, in our schools and in other schools when I visit um, and I see that technology is being used really well, it's almost invisible. You, don't, you can't see that it's a Chromebook or a laptop or an iPad. It's, it's almost like it's just part of the classroom. It's a tool. It's, it's oxygen. It's, it's a pencil. 
And in a lot of ways, um, you know, you don't go into a classroom and say, okay, class, today we're going to do an iPad lesson about iPads or a Chromebook lesson about Chromebooks. It's a, today we're going to learn about the solar system and I want you to use the tools in front of you to which demonstrate your learning. And that's when you start realizing the really wealth of opportunities and possibilities that could happen inside a classroom. So uh, it, it was kind of neat to see that. And as we walked through schools in Eanes, we noticed more and more, you know, these are the things that were, kids were getting a part of. And it was teaching them some of the soft skills that they needed to learn because we were really great at academics. I'll tell you, Eanes ISD, we graduate 99% uh, of our kids get accepted into four-year colleges. So extremely successful school um, academically. But what we noticed from our students was uh, when they when they would go to college and write back to us and, and connect with us again, they would say, you know, you prepared us for academics, um, but you really didn't uh, prepare us for the other things in life. You know, the, the things that the struggles of, of, of failure and perseverance and, and creativity and what did it look like when you would have, um, you know, a, a classroom full of 300 students with their laptops open and we're just distracted with all these things because we hadn't really introduced technology into our schools at that time. And so we thought, how do we attack that? And technology was one way to do it. So that's that's kind of why we started it originally, because it wasn't just for academic reasons. We wanted it for more of those soft skills. So um, we'll open up the discussion next, uh, and, and we'll try this virtual group discussion. And so talking about those skills, um, what do you think are some of the skills that our students are going to need? I mentioned a few just then. Um, what are some skills that our students will need to be successful in the future workplace? Um, so I'd be curious to see. So we'll break into groups. Um, I think Mitchell. Uh, minimize this to a smaller screen and then we'll go down into groups and I see some heads down there which is good hello people I can see you can wave and I can see you those of you that have your cameras on thank you for smiling um, and if you have uh, if you're someone with a, an actual icon maybe you guys can click on each other and kind of form groups we'll try this and if you just have a um, hey look there they go forming into groups that's awesome um, and if you're just someone who's just kind of has the uh, egg head avatar you can maybe combine and do a chat um, with somebody do a little IM chat. This looks good. And I think uh, more than two can join a group. So that lone gentleman, there you go. I saw some people by themselves there for a minute. So I guess go ahead and discuss this question. I'll be in the IM, but I'll also pop into some groups and listen in. Um, and then we'll come back up and maybe call one or two of you up on stage to kind of talk about this in greater extent. So we'll try this for about a minute or two. All right. So I see uh, virtually all of you have, have gone into groups, which is great. Those of you who do not have webcams, uh, what you can do is you can type in uh, some of your ideas into the IM. And those of you who are in groups, as you come up with some of these ideas, maybe you can type them into the IM chats as well. I, what I think I'll do is I'm going to bring Carl back up now, and let's see what people have been talking about. So, Carl, you got to participate in groups, and I, I also want to say some of you are still hooked up in groups, which is fine, um, but you may start hearing some feedback, and if you want to, you can move your cursor back over your avatar, and one of the options is going to be to mute your mic. Uh, that will get rid of the feedback in case you have feedback. But in any case, so Carl, uh, you had a chance to participate in some of the groups. What were, what were some of the things you, you noticed? Well, it was interesting. We were, we were talking about, uh, you know, challenges. I think the last group I was with, I believe it was Amanda who was mentioning something about, um, no, Stevie said something to me about, uh, you know, letting kids um, kind of create their, kind of solve their own problems in some ways and make them creative problem solvers and not just kind of give them all the answers and how do we, how do we encourage them to do that? 
And it was funny because actually while we were doing that, um, we had a creative problem solver in our group, which was Michael, who uh, whose mic wasn't working. So he held up a piece of paper to actually show that look in the chat box because I've actually responded to the question. Um, and so I thought that was very creative. And I said, yeah. And in a way, we were talking about it doesn't really just stop with the students because in some ways we want our teachers to also do that. And I think uh, in my district, we have a ed tech at every campus. And I've told my ed techs, I said, you know, if we're really doing our job, you know, perfect, um, we'll be out of a job because we'll be encouraging teachers to kind of be problem solvers too. And um, it's, it was a good conversation. And one of the things that reminded me of was this morning we had a discussion at the Future Ready Summit about um, taking off the training wheels with kids and how um, grit, uh, which was a word that I think that Stevie used, is something that's lacking somewhat too. And that kind of idea that, um, you know, you can make a mistake or you could fail. And we don't really allow that much room for that in a K-12 space. And so when they get to college, they make their first big giant mistake and the training wheels come off and they figured out, oh, now I figured out how to ride a bike and I don't, I've never done it before. Um, and so they don't know how to recover from that. And so I thought that was really good in terms of skills that we don't talk about a lot, but that are really important and valuable all throughout. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to Karen for a little bit. I heard I came in just a little bit of your conversation, Karen, and I know she was talking about writing and communication skills um, also being important. And, and I think that was reiterated in the, uh, in the chat window as well, that communication, interview skills, um, being a team player, uh, these are all things that I thought were pretty important. And, um, and that mentions flexible thinking too, which is great. It's you know, kind of the idea that I can adapt on the fly. And, 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 and I would add to that, Nat, is a non-judgmental thinking, which is a really challenging thing, especially during a 2016 presidential election uh, <laughs> that's out there now. Uh, it's a hard thing for adults to model, but it's also hard for kids to not say immediately, oh, I don't like that, or I do like that. Instead, to fully listen to an idea and then say, hmm, okay, I'll add to that, or I'll, 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 plus, I'll, add, I'll plus that, is what we say in our district. Like, I'll yes and to that instead of no but. Um, so those are some yeah, of the conversations. Yeah, do, do you want to ask if there's a volunteer who wants to discuss any of these points yeah. with you? Okay. Well, I would so, love it. Um, yeah, it'd be great if somebody could raise their hand. Uh, that means click on that raise hand button, and then I'll pull myself down, and you can actually talk, uh, talk with Carl. Um, oh, come on! It's not. It's <laughs> he, you're not going to bite, right? I mean, you're from Texas, but you're not a bad guy, right? Hey, you know, if you got barbecue sauce on you, be careful, but. <laughs> Uh, so maybe on the next one we'll get a volunteer. Any brave uh, souls? They're all doing the they're doing the middle school with the student thing where they kind of look down like this. I'm not going to look at the teacher. I'm going to look down over here. He doesn't see me. <laughs> so, okay. So so um, so we'll give them a break on this one. Next one maybe we won't give the people a break. You can uh, we'll kind of arbitrary pick, arbitrarily pick somebody if uh, nobody raises their hand. But I'll. That you might as well move on with the slides then, right? Sure. Go ahead and go to that next one. <coughs> Sorry about that. The other thing about being in Texas is I get some really lovely allergies here in Austin, so my voice is starting to get a little bit raw. And now here comes a giant slide, obviously, by the size of that downloading picture. Whoa, there we go. So um, this next slide is actually a, a representation of those soft skills that we were kind of discussing in the chat a little bit. Um, and let's see, right now it's still showing me the virtual group discussion slide, Mitch. So I don't know if you can change it to the next one. There, there we go. Um, so this is actually a, a friend of mine who I had the honor of being with uh, th this morning in our Future Ready Summit is Tracy Clark. And you can see her handle is down in the bottom right corner of this graphic, and Tracy Clark 08 on Twitter. Um, great educator. She's at ELA. Uh, she also teaches um, uh, ESL and ELL um, in in uh, fourth grade. I think is what her position was. And now she's actually a coder and designer, which is uh, incredible. Um, but uh, one of the things that she was looking at in her research was what are some skills that not only teachers but also what do the Fortune 500 CEOs want in their students, in their employees, if you will. So. These are the, the traits that they want in their current employees, but also those that are coming out of college. And this graphic helped me quite a bit in my district because one of the things, you know, with academics, you always focus on test scores. It's like, that's got to be the thing that we focus on. Um, but this really showed us that these are the skills that we also heard over and over again from our students that had left us that they still needed help with. And so you see the four C's there, creativity, communication, collaboration, critical thinking. Um, you see that resilience, that grit um, that we talked about earlier that Stevie mentioned. Um, a time management organization, if you have any middle school boys, especially, I would say any uh, anybody, uh, middle school generally, those are two things that they struggle with, uh, even through high school. 
um, and becoming those self-directed teamwork. I think Nat mentioned in the chat was one. So I won't go through all of these, but as you can see, there's definitely some skills here. What you don't see on this chart is anything about test taking. You don't see anything about um, iPads or you know technology, uh, math, science. You don't see any of that on here. It's it, these are all skills that can be used in many different areas, and that's what I love about the graphic. And so I share it quite a bit when I talk to to schools and school leaders, um, just because I feel like these are the things that we need to kind of be think, thinking about. How are we integrating this into the classroom too? And and they're in some ways equally, if not more important, um, for for life success for our students. Um, so kind of taking that idea and that concept uh, and then kind of uh, breaking up the mobile learning into this quadrant is what we call it, I call it. So what you guys are seeing is a sneak preview. This is actually something that's coming out in book four. Uh, we, I call it the mobile learning quadrant. And it was kind of like, I felt like as we, as I had discussions with teachers and talked with students over the last five years, that things tended to drift into these four areas when it came to mobile learning. Um, and this is where there was some kind of battle whether it be over content, whether it be the use of the space in the classroom, whether it be the type of interaction or the use of time. Um, and, and some of these I'll admit right now is that some of these we haven't even mastered. We're still in the process of trying to figure out. And I think that's what's great about this is that we're always learning and trying to improve in our district too. So don't feel like what I'm about to tell you is the gospel. It's just something that we've done that's successful. Um, but we'll start with content. And when you look at content, it's, it's really, uh, it comes down to two different things. And it's, um, and you'll see on the next slide, it comes down to kind of, uh, how are you? Are, how are the students consuming content, or are they creating it? And and what is a what is the level of measure in your classroom in terms of how often are they doing one or the other? And I don't have a perfect right answer. I don't. I won't say that it should be 50-50, or I won't say you know because there are days when you need to have some consumption of content. When they need to read, they need to they need to absorb some of it. Um, but there are days when I feel like um, and, and there's actually I don't think I have this graphic to share with you, but there's actually some research out of Stanford recently that that brought out. Um, that questioning actually declines after the age of four with students. So um, when they get four years old, they're asking about 200 questions in, a, a day. And, and I have a four-year-old and I can tell you, yes, she asks about 200 questions a day. But as content tends to increase in terms of reading and writing, um, the amount of questions dives off. And so by the time they're in sixth grade, they're asking zero to two questions a day, um, and curiosity-related questions, not like clarifying questions, but you know, just kind of a I wonder questions. And so you know, the challenge here for all of us is how do we continue to give them some of that consumption and some of that content, but also kind of keep their creative and questioning mind kind of active and live. Um, and if you look at content, you know, on the next slide, you'll see like when I think of content in the media world, I think of this, you know, and, and if I asked you guys 15 years ago, how many of you receive a newspaper on your doorstep? I mean, maybe most of your hands would go up or half your hands would go up. If I asked this question today, it's maybe just a few. Um, and you think about where news is coming from nowadays, and it's coming from everywhere. I was just, uh, before I even got on this chat, I was on Twitter um, having a conversation with someone over the Future Ready Summit today. And, and, and you see, you know, Twitter becomes kind of, we all become our mobile reporters. And the difference between the news uh, with the newspaper and even the television news is that all of a sudden it's not filtered. Um, it's no longer, you know, put in a process where a news story happens, um, someone decides to write it, and then it's edited. Uh, and then it's published, and then it lands on your doorstep, you know, 12 to 18 hours later. Instead, it's instant. And uh, the one story I'll share real quick on this on this slide they'll show you is that, you know, this is a him, this is a reporter who was actually talking about how he wrote his whole cover story about Twitter. But it was around the same time that the Boston Marathon bombing happened, um, and I was uh, following along on Twitter, and my wife was watching on the television news, and I looked over at her and I was like, hey, they just found a guy, he, you know, he's in a boat and I think they're tracking him down. And then five minutes later on the television news, they said, hey, we just found a guy, he's in a boat and we're tracking him down. And she looked at me and said, how did you figure that out so fast? And I said, well, I'm watching the hashtag on Twitter and the news was coming so much quicker. Um, and then I had to tell her and like I tell students, and if this is the first time you've heard this, I'm sorry, but not everything you see on the internet is real. Uh, and so as teachers, we also need to tell our students that while there is a lot of information and a lot more than we ever had before, we also need to discern what's credible and what isn't, um, what's, a, what's a good source and what's a bad source and how to have multiple sources to kind of define a point. Um, and so then I'll transition from the media industry into the school world. And when you think about school, this is what I think about um, much like the newspaper industry, you know, in some ways. And by the way, for those of you that aren't in Texas, You'll notice that top book there is, uh, you know, you guys may have your version of science, but we have Texas science. You can only imagine what that might be. Um, but with the, with this industry, think about the same thing uh, with the newspaper. You know, it's it's uh, there's some content that someone wants you to learn. They write about it. It's edited. It's published. And then it's delivered to your bookshelf in your classroom uh, and, or your student's backpack. And it sits there for one year, two years, five years. Um, some school districts have told me 10 years they'll have the same book. 
and the content just stays right there and it doesn't move and it's not nimble anymore. And, and all of that is shifting now. Uh, we see it a lot with um, OER, uh, ck12.org you see up there in the upper left. That's a great resource. Uh, there's a district, El Paso ISD, a uh, pretty large district here in Texas that has shifted all of their content to open resource. So they have quit purchasing textbooks from the major textbook publishers. They've gone to ck12.org and downloaded their own flexbooks and remixed those and made them available for students on their devices. And if there's a case where a student can't or doesn't have a device, you could always still go to the printing press and print out a book for them. Um, but in a lot of ways, it makes it a lot more nimble uh, in terms of the content and they can remix it and then the district owns it and then they share it. Um, uh, the bottom two down there, I'll point out, we're using quite heavily uh, the one is uh, the one with a the pen there is I is iBooks author, and so since we have one to one iPads, we've had um, an initiative lately where we're having a pilot group of teachers design their own textbooks using uh, iBooks author, which gives it uh, interactive widgets and quizzing and and videos and, and interactive content. So it's not just a plain PDF um, because a lot of the textbook companies, uh, I'll be honest, especially some of the big three, um, they 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 put out textbooks in a digital format, but they're really just a PDF version of a regular book. There's nothing really new to that. Um, so they're not really taking advantage of the platform of an interactive screen like an iPad or, or a Chromebook that can get access to multiple resources quickly. Um, so we decided to start designing that ourselves. And it's not easy, I'll tell you, we've struggled already um, getting that off the ground, but it's something that we're definitely trying and pushing. And then Google Classroom over there in the bottom right is something that we have also shifted to because it's it's free, it's available. And, and in talks with Google, they promise uh, not to get rid of it right away. So, and hopefully ever, um, they said they're going to build it up, but it's not going to be a full-blown um, learning management system, which I know that some districts are purchasing. So we had one of those and we decided to switch off of it because we felt like Google Classroom offered us what we needed quickly and then we could save that money to purchase other resources if we needed some. Um, so Google Classroom is what we're using to kind of shift content back and forth. Um, so if I go back to that graphic, um, that soft skills bingo card, you can see in there that there is a lot of content. There's no place for actual, like I said, math content or reading content, but these are all the skills. Again, how do we put this into a textbook form? We really can't. Um, and this is where it starts to shift to that idea of creation of content versus just consumption of it. And, and how do you teach that resiliency? Well, you have, some, you have a student design something and then it fails, and then they have to figure out how do I fix it and make it better? Um, you know, how, do you, how do you give them that idea that they can be motivated to kind of improve upon something that they've already designed? Or how do they adapt to the changes of like, well, I had this great group of people I was working with, and now you put this other student in my group that I don't get along with, but I'm gonna have to figure out a way to get along with them. Because in life, and you guys know this, there's people they're not going to get along with. And, and when they go to college, there's professors they won't get along with. And, and they have to learn how do they adjust with that as well. And I think that's part of that, that kind of idea of being adaptable to change and, and that teamwork module there. Um, and the one thing I don't see on here is, you know, bubble in test sheets. I don't see, form, I don't see what you'll see on the next slide, the assessment, as it were. Um, and, and, and I think this is a necessary thing to discuss because in the United States, you know, it's still, uh, you know, high stakes assessments still pay big bucks. And they're still a part of what drives a lot of schools, unfortunately, because of kind of the way the media kind of likes to put scores on schools and say you're an A or B rating. But again, I think what the problem with it is it takes the focus away from those soft skills that I just showed you. Um, however, this is a necessary thing that we have to go through too with our students. And we don't need to necessarily teach them how to bubble in sheets, but you, know, you can learn a lot of perseverance and grit from taking these tests. And, and some kids, some of the best students I've ever seen um, just completely fall apart when they see these bubbles. And uh, I've heard stories of third graders in our own district that were just, uh, last year a third grader got violently ill and was throwing up because they were so stressed out about the, this test. And, 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 we, and we kind of have to figure out a way to take and soften the focus of that because when we've seen it in environments where they had project-based learning um, or inquiry-based learning, those environments where it's not just all about the test, the students still excel at the test. And so I, I think we need to kind of continue to push that shift to that student center, which we'll get to in a little bit with the interactivity part. And this next book, and I just realized it's cut off a little bit, but um, this is actually a test prep book, um, and you can't see it, but uh, it's scary. The, this book is actually geared toward kindergartners. And the top of the book, like I said, it got cut off because I, I, I realized I sent the wrong slide now, but um, this is a test prep book for Common Core for kindergarten students. So when they think future ready, they're thinking we need to get them ready for the future of taking tests, which is kind of scary, but this is a book that's out there. And, and I show it as a cautionary tale, but also to say, you know, this is something in some districts, this is still priority one. And in your district, you may be struggling with this same thing. You may be thinking, how do I overcome this, Carl, when, you know, we're kind of told that they need to consume and take the test and practice the test. How do I slice in a little bit of creativity? Um, 
And so my next question with you is this, and that is kind of both, uh, it's twofold, so virtual group discussion. One will be, you know, I'll talk about online instructional materials, maybe your successes with them and how they impact learning. But another question that I didn't throw in here is one I just mentioned, which is how do you, how do you shift uh, more creativity into your classroom from consumption? Or, or maybe you already have and you're being successful with it and, and you could share that story. So um, let's break back into groups. Uh, and you can either answer the questions listed here or the one I just mentioned about uh, kind of creativity versus consumption. Um, so we break into groups. Yeah, I brought Carl down so he can uh, join the groups with you. And uh, again, those of you who do not have uh, webcams, um, you should uh, type in your answers to this question. Uh, oh, let me shrink it. I'm so sorry. Um, let me answer, uh, type in your answers to this question or to the other question, which is uh, how do we reduce consumption to increase creativity in the classroom? And uh, we'll come back up in a couple minutes uh, to give you a chance to discuss this. Um, and if you have questions, uh, don't forget you can uh, you can click on that ask button and uh, and ask a question. Well, it looks like there's been some really good discussions going on uh, since it's almost quarter of and uh, it, it we're about uh, we're not quite half done. I think I'm going to call Carl back up. Uh, we may actually go a little bit beyond the uh, the hour with this group, but let, let me call Carl up and let's see what you've all been talking about. OK, so instead of summarizing the way we did last <laughs> time, who do you want to call someone up? up? Yeah. Uh, Michael, where are you at? So since he was, he was the only one in our group who had his microphone working correctly. So gonna, and he and he troubleshot it because originally he was the one that actually came up with the piece of paper to show that he didn't get it to work. So, um, so Michael, why don't you come up and tell us a little bit about what you're experiencing? So I think Michael is a second year teacher, agriculture, um, and he's he okay, was telling I, me I that. Just shared. Okay, go ahead. I was just sharing with our group that my personal experiences uh, taking online classes have been pretty frustrating because I've missed the interaction with classmates. And I think there's a lot of that you get out of that collaboration. And then in my personal classroom with my students, one of the frustrations that I've had has been um, the computers that, I, that are in my classroom that, the, that everyone has access to were purchased in 2008. And when I let the kids use their cell phones, then they get distracted easily and get off task uh, fairly, fairly easily. Oh, and your lights just he's in a, a motion sensitive classroom. So you're doing energy saving there. <laughs> <laughs> so they save energy, but you have computers from 2008 in your classroom, too, I see. So, yes. <laughs> exactly well, I know it's right. behind. I noticed behind you there, you have some desks. Are those like the all-in-one? We still have a lot of those too, the all-in-one desks and, uh, yep. Oh. oh, there we go. Oh, and you got the television up there too. Yeah, that, that, that does not work. Um, the, uh, this is actually one of my co-teachers classrooms. I'm in a, I'm in a smaller classroom and then I have an ag, we have a barn, a farm here at school. So 
Um, one of the ways that we've used technology with that is doing the Google Hangouts, and we broadcast from our barn uh, to some fourth grade classrooms in, in, uh, in our school district to teach them about whatever it is that we're doing with the animals. And that's hands-on learning right there. Um, and that's a great way. And we talked, we talked a little bit about the, the distraction element. Uh, and I think some of you, and maybe a couple of your pre-survey questions that asked about classroom management and the issues with that. And I think uh, it directly goes to a lot of the, what we're talking about just now in this section, and, and you'll see in some of the other sections, which is, uh, and Michael mentioned this too, about in terms of use of space, which we'll get into in the next group. And that is, you know, he walks around the room and makes sure it's like, I think teachers sometimes, uh, we've had a couple that do this where they will sit in their desk and kind of say, okay, what are you doing over there? What are you doing over there? But they won't actually get up and move around with the kids. And so you'll notice the distraction goes way up, right? You know, in that situation. Um, some of the other things I noticed that some of the groups were talking about, and Nat was in our group, but he wasn't able to, uh, to join in with his voice, but he had mentioned on his chat that uh, he does the, they, he's a part of the Go Open movement, which uh, we're talking about open resources. And it's something that uh, the U.S. government, U.S. Uh, DOE put out, and we're going to sign off for this too. And the idea is you pledge to basically build or create your own open resource. I think one textbook in the first year um, is kind of the, all you have to do to pledge to it. And then part of that, you're part of this bigger consortium, which I think is great. Um, I realize now, though, Mitch, that we're we're like way behind time. So I don't know if you want me to kind of go through these last few quick, and then we can kind of do a group discussion at the end. Would that sound good? So I personally, I'm much more inter. You know, I think it's much more effective to have the interactivity and the deep learning. And if we don't cover everything, you know, your your book really isn't very expensive, right? No, oh, yeah, it's, I think it's not. It's seventeen not, seventeen bucks from ISTE. Yeah. There you go. Thanks right. for the plug. <laughs> okay, and then right. uh, and and then maybe maybe this fall we'll do a, a part two also, or you know we'll, okay. we'll focus on other things. So I'll bring your slides back up, and um, yeah, we won't finish everything, but what we cover we'll cover deeper. Okay, so we'll do this next section on space, and then um, we'll we'll do a little bit of Q and A, and then I'll kind of end it with the last kind of slide to go over all of these kind of in greater detail, just a, a summary of it, so you guys kind of see what the what the last kind of picture looks like. Um, and, and so kind of dovetailing off of what Michael was talking about, they just, the idea of space becomes big in the classroom too in terms of static or dynamic. And um, when I say static or dynamic, I think about, again, back to media as an example. So I mentioned the newspapers before. This time I'll mention the radio. And in the 1930s, you saw this unit on the left there, that beautiful RCA stereo. It was beautiful as a piece of furniture. It stayed in the middle of the, of the, of the building or the middle of your house and people would listen to it. And, and you know, you were kind of forced to listen to whatever your parents wanted to listen to in some ways. But then it was all usurped by that piece of technology on the right, that little transistor radio in the 1950s. And, and every teenager wanted their hands on that thing because it gave them mobility, it gave them personal choice. Um, and really, it's kind of interesting, but if you think about the phenomenon of music, um, at least in American culture, really rock and roll took off right about the time that those, those transistor radios came up to be because, you know, our parents weren't gonna let us listen to rock and roll on that big radio on the left. And, and the sound quality, on that little shirt pocket radio was awful. Uh, it didn't sound good at all, but you know, kids still went for it. It's almost like if you think about having a full blown, beautiful laptop with a nice screen um, and your phone, you know, both are computers in their own right and one can do more than the other. But you know, it's like, you know what, even though I kind of sacrifice a little bit, it, the phone is so much more convenient, it's mobile, it's, it's personalized, I can get to things quickly um, and it gives us that opportunity. And so I wrote this post uh, called The Death of the Student Desk. Um, an obituary, if you will, to it. And it's, uh, it kind of went viral for a little bit. And it was really based on the idea that um, I visited a classroom in, uh, in Eanes that had, had switched to some mobile furniture. And I think I have a picture of it coming up in a minute. Um, and, and after I going to this classroom, I thought, oh, why are we not switching to this more often? And I started thinking, you know, who has the most comfortable uh, chairs in the entire school district? Is it the, you know, the, and some people say, well, the teachers have the most comfortable chairs. And I said, well, Go up the food chain a little bit there, and you'll see that you know principals probably have the really good chair. The superintendent has a really good chair. Uh, in our district, the board members have beautiful. You know, a lot of districts, the board members have these beautiful plush kind of mahogany cushion chairs, um, and they sit in them twice a month um, for just a few hours. So, you know, the, where what we needed to do is shift that kind of idea and thinking. And so, what we did is we had some students bring this desk you see right here, the all-in-one desk that I think Michael was just showing us in the back of his room. They brought some of these into this board meeting. And actually had had the t uh, board members sit in them, and and it's interesting because you look at college, and, and he was talking about uh, Michael's talking about going to online college, but here's the actual physical college. This is not an old picture. Uh, this was Texas A&M when I visited it in 2014 to do a guest lecture. Uh, I walked into this classroom, 
and those desks are bolted to the ground and it's really hard to have interactivity to have small group discussion when you're bolted to the ground and if you're a left-handed student in this classroom you're really in trouble because look there's nothing there's no left-handed desks in there um, and I asked the professor, I was like, how are you getting them to interact? And he's like, well, really, my job is to talk to them for three hours and their job is to listen. And um, he goes, that's what they're paying to come here. And I said, really? I thought they were coming here to learn, you know, and, and we got in a little argument um, and we talked about technology in which he pointed out to me that he had two major pieces of technology in this classroom. And if you look really closely in this image, you can see them both. Um, there's a uh, overhead projector in the, in the upper right corner. And then in case that one goes out, he has another overhead projector over by the doorway on the left, which I thought was really funny um, that that was his idea of what he's like, this is great. You know, I'm cutting edge. So, you know, how do we kind of shift from this thinking? And then knowing that the brain requires some level of movement. Um, and this is a lot of research now that talks about how uh, sitting is the new smoking when it comes to what it's doing to your body, but also to your brain. Um, and if you think about uh, some of the research that's out there now, this is from University of Illinois. It's got some uh, Dr. Hillman's got some great research out about it now about the age of students um, kind of is a is a corollary to how many minutes they can go before they need a transition. So um, a six year old, like when I taught first grade, needed a transition about every six or seven minutes. And that didn't mean stand up and do a jumping jack, but just kind of a, all right, turn and talk, or here's an assignment. They can't listen to me for more than five or six minutes, like you guys have been doing for the last four minutes, essentially. So if you're sitting at your computer now, I would encourage you to stand up and stretch for a minute. But uh, I think it's important to do that with not only kids, but also adults when it comes to professional learning. So. Um, if you ever attend a session of mine, I'll always do brain breaks about every 20 minutes. Even in a keynote, I'll make the entire room stand up and do something silly. Um, and it's interesting to think about movement and what's happening right now, the phenomenon of Pokemon Go. I made a joke about it earlier because my kids are actually out there hunting for them now. Um, and this has really taken the world by storm. And, and, uh, and it's actually on the next slide, Mitch. But there's, uh, you know, the idea is that you can go around and out and catch these things. You think, well, the Carl, this has no real place in, you know, where does it have a place in schools? And I think, well, it kind of, in ways, it uses technology to encourage movement. And say what you will about that, you know, it's still good to go out and just move around. But like I walked, I think, six and a half miles last week with my three kids just looking for these things around our neighborhood. Um, and I had done that year in the weeks before that. We'd gone on little walks with our dog and stuff, but never done, you know, to the extent of where it's like, Dad, you got to get out there and, and we got to move some more so we can get more of these things. I like, what a great idea. Um, and their screens aren't, their faces aren't buried in the screen. It's very much, it, it alerts someone one's close by and it kind of gets them moving. But it, it encourages that concept of movement again. And then the next slide, you'll see kind of what a classroom, you know, with some of this mobile furniture looks like. What I love about this picture is um, the teacher, you look at where the teacher is, and she's sitting off to the right. And there's a student that's actually leading the discussion. Um, this is a third grade class doing, um, they're doing today's meet, and they're talking about back channel in their classroom. And you can see there, there's some desks. I'll tell you this classroom, there's 22 kids in this class, and there are only 12 desks. Uh, we did that on purpose, and actually over on the left you see a little puzzle table with some, uh, they call them ho uh, hockey stools. They're little like uh, mushroom chairs that can kind of rotate, and they, they wobble. So when you sit on them, you have to sit upright and kind of keep your core engaged. Uh, and a couple of students, especially that were the real wiggly ones, um, they just took to those chairs. And all of a sudden, because they had a little bit of energy and engagement in their core, they were able to actually focus their energy a little bit more on what the teacher was talking about or what the students were going over. And you know, some kids are on the floor. Again, with mobile devices, um, really, it, you don't have to be tied at the back of the room to that computer center anymore. You can get up and move around. You even see a Twitter wall uh, over there on the right corner. It's an actual, she actually taught them how to use, like they wrote 140 characters on post-it notes and would post tweets on each other's wall, which is kind of interesting because they weren't actually using social media for that. These are third graders, but I thought that was pretty, pretty fun. So um, kind of this last question about space, and that is how do you think the configuration of a classroom can affect learning? Um, you saw some of it there. Uh, what are some ways that you think that the uh, configuration can affect learning? And then maybe in your discussion, talk about some things you've seen or some things you're trying to do uh, when it comes to classroom space, um, whether it be with mobile learning or just learning in general. Okay, so this is uh, probably the final chance for you all to work together in small groups and uh, talk about how the configuration of your classroom could affect learning and maybe even add a twist you know how about the materials you use in the classroom the electronic materials um, how can they affect uh, learning and interaction among among your students so uh, talk about those questions and uh, in three minutes uh, Carl and I will come back and hopefully get a volunteer
Well, okay, since it's, uh, we're heading up to the top of the hour, I'm going to bring Carl up in a second. Uh, there he goes. Okay. And let's see. So, um, so do you think we can get a volunteer this time? Uh, well, Karen had a really cool idea, and I want her to share it. It's something that they're doing in their school um, when it comes to kind of the last two topics, content and also um, mobile learning and, or kind of a space. So if you see Karen, Karen or Karen, C-A-R-Y-N. Okay. okay. Um, and I want her to share her idea, um, an innovative idea that she's sharing about uh, how to learn or what your teachers are having to do one day. Okay, it's really dark now. The sun has gone down in Nebraska. Um, so one of the school districts, in they have a speech meet, and they run the speech meet during the school day, and the students actually, in the past, have just gone home and not had school. Well, he's going to count it as an instructional day, the superintendent. And so all of their, all their class assignments, everything will be completed during that day and count as an instructional day via technology. So it's pretty exciting. That's awesome. And uh, Nat, who was also in our group, had mentioned uh, something about called snow bags that Burlington does. It's a school district up in uh, Massachusetts that uh, Patrick Larkins, assistant superintendent of a good friend of mine, and he's talking about snow bags as a snow day replacement. So it's uh, instead of um, missing a, uh, a quote unquote school day, the kids have it's a replacement day where kids actually do online work to make up for snow days, which I think I'm going to have to research that more, Nat. Thank you for sharing that. I love that idea. We don't we don't get a lot of snow days here in Texas, um, <laughs> but when there's any ice, uh, if there's even the thought of ice, we cancel school. So it's a it's a handy thing to have. And we were talking a lot about how um, uh, when Karen brought that up, it was like, yeah, it's funny. We, we still get money from our state funding from for seat time, but physical seat time. But we're also trying to push virtual learning and online blended learning environment. So it's like, wh which way do we want to go as a state? But I think we need to start shifting the idea that you have to be in the seat to learn. Um, and one of the things I've done with professional development, we started doing uh, Twitter chats um, for PD, which I know a lot of districts are starting to do now. And one of my administrators told me, well, how do you know that they're they're learning if they're not in the room? And I said, well, how do you know that they're learning if they're in the room? Because <laughs> you don't, you know, they could just be sitting there doing something else, you know, shopping on eBay. Um, so thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. I think we're going to wrap up, uh, Mitch. Um, there he comes. Yeah, so... Um... So I'm going to ask you, maybe you could just come up with it. If you had your choice of three things that you wanted people to take back with them from from the session tonight, what would be three things that you'd want them to take back? I mean, I, I think the word student-centered is, is overused, but I think it still needs to be brought up, and I think that's still my number one, I mean, in a lot of ways. And, and when you think about the two topics in particular that we talked about today, um, the idea that the student comes first is an important thing. And, I, and um, so I, I guess the first thing would be that, yeah, whatever you're designing or creating in your schools is to try to keep that in mind. And I think that's an easy thing to say, but it's a hard thing to actually do sometimes because we are getting force fed some content and, and some assessments and we have to figure out where does the student fit in this and where does the student's choice fit into that, which is also important. Technology can leverage a lot of that for us. We can give kids a lot more opportunities and choices and level the playing field. Um, the second thing is, you know, to be, be cognizant of the level of creation that's happening in your classroom um, versus consumption. And so if you are moving forward with mobile devices or more mobile learning or bringing phones in and things like that, um, try to make sure that the kids are creating as often, if not more often, uh, than they are consuming in some ways. And I think that's, I will never, like I said, put an exact number on it, but I've seen that when kids create more, they learn more in general because it's the application level. You see that the old learning pyramid from 1972 that you know shows when they hear, they only remember about five to 10% of it. But when they actually apply, it's like 50 to 75%. And then when they teach it, it's like 90% is what they retain. Um, so again, having kids create and apply that learning is important. Um, and then the last one is um, be flexible. You know, uh, the classrooms have shifted a lot. And, and I know not everyone in here is a, is a classroom teacher or some of you, uh, like Karen mentioned, she's professional development and I do the same. Um, so be thinking about your audience at all times and think about movement and think about the brain and how important that is and, um, you know, getting that oxygen flow and, and have little breaks throughout the day and, and kind of chunk things up. So if you're doing professional development, you know, I try to make it a rule of 20 minutes and I never go more than 20 minutes without some sort of transition. And if you're teaching in the classroom, that should be the same, if not less, you know, as smaller kids, of course, less time. So be cognizant of the brain and that kind of movement. Well, okay. So um, I, I'd like to encourage people to type into that IM window. Uh, their ideas are the things that, that they most that they feel is uh, they most likely to, they're most likely to take back and implement when they get back to the schools. 
And again, I'm the only person who doesn't see that as, at all. So, Carl, oh. if you see some of the things that people are typing in, maybe you can repeat them. Yeah, and I wanted to give a shout out to Linda uh, Grossman, who had mentioned a couple things too about um, she's a she's a professor, <clears throat> which I think is important, and it's kind of the missing piece here too. Is like where are the kids are ending up. Um, so she talked about how they use OER books and the kids love the cost, but they tend to not to use it. So they actually end up encouraging them to purchase books because they felt like they would use it more often. Um, Michael's mentioning he likes, he wants to look forward to more mobile furniture. Um, as we saw in the back of Michael's classroom there, he was able to show us. Um, of course, that mobile furniture, Michael, would also help with the lights not going out, right? Because you'll be moving a lot more when you're, if the kids are sitting still. You know it's bad if in your classroom, Michael, the lights go out. You're like, wow, we're not moving at all in here because the lights don't detect movement. Um, so it sounds like uh, a, they, they might have been at a Met game then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, the Met jokes. Um, and then I think Kelly mentioned, and Kelly, I, uh, uh, it was Ken who came from Australia. I don't remember where Ke Kelly's from. I don't know if she pointed out where she's from. Um, talked about creating projects uh, and group projects and, and, and really how that helps with integration of technology. I'll throw in a caveat there, or an extra, and I had a caveat, an actual bonus to that, Kelly, and that is that we've seen in, in classrooms, um, even with teenagers, with mobile devices and access to everything, when you're doing more projects and more inquiry-based projects, there's a lot less distraction. I mean, it totally dovetails off. In fact, I can almost correlate, um, reverse correlate the difference between distractions high when the con when it's traditional teaching with consumption of content versus student-centered with um, a lot of project-based and inquiry-based. You almost see hardly any distraction because then you're working as a team and you're engaged uh, in the learning. So I think that's good. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, and then Nat said something about, oh, it wasn't snow bags. It was called blizzard bags. And so he has a link that he sh uh, hopefully he'll share with the group. Um, there was the idea that Burlington uses for makeup days with snow, which I thought was good. Lizard bags. Lizard bags. Yeah, I and, like it. And you're not going to, well, for years, for I guess in Austin, they'd be ice bags, right? Because. Yeah, I see. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be thought of ice bags. It's not even ice bags here. It's just the thought of ice is enough to make us cancel sometimes. Well, here, the thought of ice would be very comfortable. It's about um, 90 degrees uh, in the New York area. It's probably even warmer in, in Austin, right? Well, imagine now, I was just thinking, imagine if every classroom had this platform, this kind of shindig platform, because literally, this is not traditional. I mean, this is, I, I am I'm sure I did a lot of talking, but we had people popping up. We were doing small group discussions. I could see as a teacher who was grouping up. Um, I think this would be a pretty neat thing uh, to do. Um, Stevie's asking if I'll have another session. Yeah, I'd love to do a follow uh, part two um, and then kind of go over the other two parts, which is interaction, which I think we had a lot of in this room, um, and then just talking about um, time. And that's really the last one because it's the most challenging, right? As we ran out today, obviously. Um, talking about time management. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to work, work on that a little bit, huh? Yeah. So, okay. Well, then maybe maybe in August or, or, or September. You know, you, you know, yeah, you September when the, when the rollouts calm down and the kids are all back and things have settled down. I'd love to do another one um, then if you'd have me back. So thank you, Mitch, by the way, for inviting me to this. And um, I appreciate being a part of this platform and getting the opportunity to talk to some great folks from all over the world. Um, and seeing some familiar faces in there. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Well, and th thank you. Um, as you know, you managed, you really pulled the group together and encouraged a lot of interaction. And that's, to, to me, that's what makes learning interesting is when, when people get together and they share ideas and, and you make learning social. And, um, you know, I hope people go out and buy mobile learning mindset. Um, I think it'll make a big, in, it'll make a big impact on education and um, every time they buy a book, you can buy like half a cup of coffee, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah, as a publisher, publishers get a lot of that. They had, the, the author doesn't, but I, I didn't write it for the money. I really did um, write it more for getting the ideas out there. So each book is a, it's got little tools built in it for whoever the leader is. So it, it, it's an easy read. It's like 90 to 95 pages. Um, and again, there's little tools in there you can pull away. So if you're a classroom teacher reading the classroom book, there's lots of little widgets and ideas and they aren't... Um, necessarily device specific. Obviously we're one-to-one -one iPads, but I kept it very device agnostic. I want you to be able to pick it up in you know, 10 years and still be able to apply the ideas and concepts behind the mindset. So, well, well, thank you. And uh, we'll email and we'll get the archives up, we'll get the slides up, and in September, uh, hopefully you'll be back and we'll do part two. And I love that everyone in the room is now um, posting their Twitter handles, which is great. So if you want to continue okay. the conversation on Twitter, um, one of the hashtags that I've started to use is ML mindset. Um, so if you post something to that ML mind, hashtag ML mobile learning mindset, I don't want to do the whole thing because it takes a lot of spaces. Um, I'll answer those questions. Of course, you can follow me at Twitter at Mr. Hooker. And Mitch, your, um, what's your Twitter handle? Weisberg M, W-E-I-S-B-E-R-G-H-M. 
Um, and I can't, I, you know, I can't uh, I uh, type to anybody. Uh, yeah, I typed it in there for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, uh, and I'll be happy, to, I'd love to join in the conversation as well. So, uh, well, um, good night. I, um, it's, it's, it's time for me to do the dishes, I guess. I postponed it long <laughs> enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mitch. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. This is Mitch Weisberg signing off. I'll see you all, hopefully, in August. And uh, have a great rest of the summer.